This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. How has the pandemic changed the way we look at attending church? Today we talk with Sam Alberry about the question many people are asking, why do I need to go back to church? But first, Pastor Kerry Schmidt was a part of a mega church in Southern California. Life was good, but a series of drastic events caused him to question his identity, leaving him to ask, who am I really? It led to this book, Stop Trying, How to Receive, Not Achieve Your Real Identity. There were a couple things that happened in your life uh, that really caused you to sit and, and pause over how you were identified, either by people on the outside or by yourself. Uh, tell me where all that started, because you were in, involved in a, in a highly successful 5,000-member uh, church in Southern California, which is a long way from New England. How did all that start? Well, about 10 years ago, we were just full steam ahead in ministry and loving what God was doing in our life and our family. And I got a cancer diagnosis. Uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma was growing five different areas in my chest. Well, that brought our life to a grinding halt. Sure. And of course, obviously God healed me, but that was a one year battle where all of a sudden things that I had subconsciously and maybe imperceptibly begun to tie my identity to, they were lost. I, I wasn't mm -hmm. able to perform and live up to the, the job and the, the expectations of others. And shortly after that battle, God began to call us from a large church to a small church. So that, and that, that was... How did that battle, you said shortly after that battle, but in the midst of that battle, were, were people from the outside redefining you or re giving you a new identity because you weren't the active part of the, the, the identity of, of pastor at that time? Well, not intentionally, mm -hmm. but, you know, suddenly you're the cancer guy. Yeah. Um, and everybody sees you through the lens of you're sick, maybe dying. And that's all good and fine. But it really created internally a question of what is God doing and where am I? in terms of my life script versus his life script. What happens at that point? You said you were, the God began to call you out of that ministry. It was about six months to a year after the battle with cancer that God began to just providentially say, uh, I'm closing this chapter and I'm really? leading you. Follow me. Um, could, could, you have ever, could you have ever imagined that as you were, I mean, before the cancer thing with the church going the way it was, could you have ever imagined that God's going to call you away from that? It was completely unimaginable. Wow. I had no plan B. <laughs> it, was off, it was totally off my radar. Wow. So God calls you, but he, I mean, it wasn't like I'm going to call you to plant a church in Northern California or in Arizona. I'm going to call you clear across the country to something that is not only alien to you, but alien to your wife. Yeah, and we didn't really know where we were going. He just said, oh, really? resign and follow me. And within a week or two of resigning, he said, okay, this is where we're going to this small church in Connecticut. This church had been bleeding a lot of cash. Uh, did that, was that a surprise to you when you come in and saw the condition that this church was in financially that you think, God, is, can this church really survive? Well, when we were candidating, I specifically asked the deacons and pulpit committee not to tell me about the money problems. <laughs> I said to them, don't tell me, they'll scare me, and I will uh, I'll run for my life. I said, what I want to know is God in this. Mm -hmm. And if he is, then his purposes will be fulfilled. But the church was running about a negative $20,000 a month cash flow. And wow. uh, we had about six months of savings at the rate we were spending it. And so it was a stark a realization the day I saw the the reality. So you begin preaching the gospel every Sunday and people start coming to the altar and people start receiving Christ. They responded with incredible resilience and faith and vision. It was the opposite of what I expected <laughs> coming to a small church in New England yeah. because they'd been praying so long for their church to fill again with new believers. So they were ready. Does your, does your identity begin to change again at that point in time? Do you see yourself as anything different than what you were when you, when you started at that church? 
No, because I think the process of cancer and the process of coming to a small church and not knowing what the outcome would be was a real uh, process of releasing any script that I had, any sense of who I would be or how this would go. And that's really the essence of a gospel identity that we unpack in the book is God defines me and my life is his. And what are, what are the choices for people as they're growing up? I mean, you talk about two identities. You talk about the traditional identity, the modern identity, and then there's also a third identity. But that, uh, unpack those for us. First of all, that traditional identity, I think most of us, uh, is that something Christians default to as they, as they grow up? Is that traditional identity? Absolutely. And a traditional identity simply defined is others define me. And traditional identity is kind of how the world works. It's performance-based. Our acceptance and mm-hmm. security and validation is conditional mm-hmm. upon whether we live up to others' expectations. And so others define me. The modern identity rebels against that model and says, no, I define you. It kind of rejects everybody else's authority mm-hmm. to speak to who I am. And it's deceptive in that it says, no, go in your heart and figure it out for yourself and declare to the world who you are. Mm -hmm. Uh, The third identity that we unpack in the book is a gospel identity. And that looks up and says, no, only God can define you. Well, let's let's look at, go back and look at that traditional identity. Uh, You you become an adult, you get married, you start a family, you're doing all these things that uh, people expect of you and you're doing it, a lot of people do it very, very well. What, what's wrong with that? Why is that insufficient? The traditional identity is weak in this respect. It is built on performance. So it's performance-based. Mm-hmm. If you're successful, you feel good about yourself. If you fail, you lose your sense of self. It is also conditional. Again, conditioned on performance as opposed to unconditional. Probably the more subtle insufficiency is it tramples over our individuality. It kind of says, forget who you want to be and be who you have to be. Is if, if that's uh, that traditional identity, we identify ourselves and we're going along and we're a husband or wife and raising kids, and there, there comes this, this time of, of uh, sin in somebody's life or failure in somebody's life, they don't live up to it, where do they go with that at that point in time? Can, is, can they lose that identity and be cast off with like, who am I now? I, I, I made this huge mistake in my life. I ruined a business. Or I ruined a marriage. Uh, where can somebody go if they've, their whole life is based on that traditional identity? Well, that's exactly what happens is the traditional identity is losable always. It's mm-hmm. breakable um, either by failure or even by hurt or abuse um, and, and when you've lost that sense of self, you, you enter a free fall in life that unless you grab a hold of the gospel, there, there is nothing but despair at the bottom of that. Well, let's talk, let's go back and unpack a little bit more about that modern identity because that's what we see in today's culture. Be true to yourself, dig deep and find out what you want and don't care what anybody else wants, but this is what I want to be if I want to become bizarre, if I want to become, you know, a, a hermit, whatever I want to do, I identify myself. And that's kind of that, what you call the modern identity in the book. Where traditional identity fails us, we tend to swing the pendulum into that modern, I'm just going to redefine myself. Mm-hmm. The problem is it, it throws me into an ocean of options. It's a total process of uh, reinvention and experimentation. It's very lonely. And at the end of the day, I can't really define myself. Mm -hmm. That's that's not even plausible because I have a creator who defined me. He created me. He wrote a script for my life. And uh, trying to do it myself is just a a failing proposition. What you see in the media uh, social media and Hollywood and places like that that's continually reinforced in people's minds that the only way you can be happy is to adapt this this modern identity to become something that and almost throw it back in the face of traditional identity. It is. It, it, this is the mainstream narrative of our culture. 
even going back to children's stories. Mm -hmm. And yet we have an angrier mm -hmm. culture than we've ever had. Our culture is just raging yeah. because that's what moder modern identity leads to anger. Uh, it, it says, I'm going to try to be the best me I can be, mm -hmm. but it, it flounders. It demands that the world validate it. And when it flounders, it gets angry at the world for not pro providing the validation. So it goes like this, Bob. If I tell you I'm a tree, <laughs> yeah. I'm <gonna> self -identify <laughs> some people do think they are. <laughs> well, I'm going to yeah. self-identify as a tree in today's narrative. You have to validate that. And that's where a lot of uh, political correct language comes from. It's a lot of the non-gender language, things like that, is that I've got to validate somebody. And so even if I don't know them, I can't make the mistake of misidentifying them when I first meet them. I can't say, sir, ma'am, things like that. Uh, it's, uh, it seems grossly unfair to the rest of the population, <laughs> rest of the population, but at the same time, it seems very fragile to those people who are self-identifying that way because they're, they're constantly uh, telling people, this is how I identify, and they almost have to, have to introduce themselves that way, is, hi, I'm Bob, and I identify as a tree. And that from that point on, that seems so shallow and insufficient and seems very, very fragile that it can just crumble because every time those people go out and introduce them some, themselves to somebody new, it could just crumble again because maybe somebody's not going to validate them and they end up in a big, angry argument. It is completely fragile because at the very core, it is a, a, a root defiance against God himself. If <clears throat> others can't define me, and if I can't define me, the only hope I have is that I have a creator who loves me and who has given me a way to have a relationship with him. And this is where the gospel comes into play. Mm -hmm. um, the identity that is horizontal in the traditional and modern identity goes vertical. And I'm going to look up to my creator and I'm going to say, God, I want you to define. Me. Well, God, he came to me. Uh, in the form of Jesus, mm -hmm. and he died on the cross and rose again to bring me back into the heart of my heavenly Father. And if the highest being in the universe forgives me, loves me, accepts me, validates me, says I have value, then I can live out of that. And I don't have to go at life looking for a sense of self. I can receive it. What do we say to people that, uh, that do have that confused? I mean, how would you lead someone to, to Christ who's lost? I mean, they've, they've spent their life in the traditional identity, and they've lost all of that. They may even be uh, at, at the end of their life. How do you approach them and say, if, to keep them from thinking that their whole life has been a failure, I, I couldn't live up to the traditional identity, didn't want to develop a modern identity. I'm laying here on my bed and I've lost everything. How do you approach that person? How, do you, how, how would you minister to that person? Well, the greatest decision in life is to trust Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if everything in my life leads me to that moment, then everything in that life was significant. Mm -hmm. And with Jesus, there is always restoration, redemption, grace, hope, and purpose and as long as there's a heart beating, God has a purpose for that person. And I would say, run back to Jesus, receive the grace of the gospel that he burrs upon you, and, and be adopted into his family, and, uh, and receive all the love that God wants to give you. But this says how to receive and not achieve your real identity. How do we, and just as we wrap this thing up, somebody out there has been struggling with it, either side, traditional or modern, how do they stop trying to achieve? How do they just stop trying? Well, Jesus' formula was if we seek to save our life, and the word he used for life is suke, which is the inner self, mm -hmm. our identity. We seek to save it, we'll lose it. But he said, whosoever will lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall find it. So walk through the loss with Jesus, walk through the finding, the losing leads to finding, and that's going to be in the gospel. And then finding leads to flourishing, and that is all of our sanctification and growth going forward. Uh, holding on to Jesus is the only formula I have.
Many of us are eager to return to normal after the pandemic. However, a lot of experts believe church attendance may never return to its pre-pandemic levels. Sam Albury is a Christian apologist and author on many subjects, including this book, Why Bother with Church? So I put the question to him, why do believers need to go back to church? Sam, uh, you wrote a book on why bother with church. What were you talking about in the book? It's, that's, a, that's a provocative title. Why bother with it when I can watch it on TV? Exactly. I, I wrote that book pre-pandemic, if you can remember mm -hmm. that, those ancient days. Yeah. Um, so th this was before COVID was even a thing. Um, we were already thinking we shouldn't bother with church even back then. And that, that question takes on renewed significance mm -hmm. uh, in these days when things are slowly beginning to open up a bit more. Why bother returning to church? Many of us have been unable to attend, even if we wanted to. And now that increasingly we can in attend, many are not wanting to. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of reasons people feel they have for not bothering with church. It's it's too dull. It's mediocre. In some cases, people would say, I've been too hurt by church, or it doesn't scratch where I itch, or the music isn't good enough, the teaching's not dynamic enough, um, or whatever it is. So a lot of Christians feel like they can do most of their Christian life without needing to be at a church on a, on a Sunday each week. Got an associate who says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a believer. I know the Bible. I've, I've read it. I study it on my own. My wife and I do devotions in the morning. Why do I need a <laughs> church? I mean, those aren't, you know, I don't relate to those people. I relate to the people I work with. Yeah, exactly. And, and again, there's, there's some truth to that. There's, we are so well resourced now. We can, we've got excellent devotional material we can get our hands on. Mm -hmm. We can listen to amazing Christian music online. We can, you know, whatever, whoever the, the best preacher is in the land, we can watch them on YouTube each week. So it feels like we can get the best ingredients of, of a good church without actually having to, to get out of bed. And, but the issue is there is something you can only get uh, by attending church that you will never get if you don't. And that is what Hebrews 10 calls encouragement. So Hebrews 10 is a key verse on this because it says famously, don't give up gathering together as some are in the habit of doing but instead encourage one another. So the opposite of not going to church in Hebrews 10 isn't going to church. The opposite of not going to church is encouraging one another. There's a peculiar form of encouragement that only really takes place as we gather together physically as God's people that we won't receive if we're not part of that physical gathering. And it's a form of encouragement God says all of us need in order to, to be healthy and growing as a, as a Christian. What, what is it in that, in, that, in that group, that physical group, that physical gathering uh, that, that God is doing through individuals and doing to individuals? Yeah. Well, this is, this is where the, the biblical image of the, of the local church being like a human body made up of, of various parts is so helpful because it shows us not only that there's a lot of other parts of the body we need, whether we're conscious of that or not, but it also shows us that we're going to be bringing something that someone else will need. And so actually what we're missing out on is, is serving others and being served by others. There's something in that dynamic that is, is vital and enriching to the Christian life. And you don't get that online. Sure. When we look at uh, you know, uh, tithing even, we look at tithing and, and God gives us the ability to, to, to get wealth. God gives us the ability to earn money and he requires that and he wants that tithe back. Uh, he does he do the same thing with the gifts. I mean, he's, he's gifted people with the ability to, to sing or talk or hospitality or prophecy or teaching. Yep. And uh, we're not spending that gift. We're not even giving him his, the 10% of it back. Exactly. And, and that's a wonderful way of thinking about it. And because God is foundationally a God who gives to us. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole gospel is predicated on the fact that God gives and we receive. Stepping into that posture of giving, whether it's of our money or our time or our emotional energy or listening or whatever it might be, there's something about stepping into that that gives us a deeper sense of what it is to follow in the footsteps of Christ himself. Mm -hmm. And he teaches us something of his own joy for the joy set before him, 
you know, he gave up his life for us. And we begin to find even in, you know, giving in the Christian life should hurt. Uh, we're meant to be giving stuff that actually we really did want to keep. Um, but in that sacrificial giving, we find ourselves stepping into a, a, a kind of a richer fellowship with Christ himself and into the joy that he has of giving to us his people. So ultimately, the more we try and keep for ourselves, whether materially or in any other area of life, actually, the more we end up being robbed of blessing. Have we, have we redefined the church, the word itself? I mean, the, the gathering of, of God's people, is it, is it a different thing? We go for different reasons or do you think we've redefined it? I think we've we've come very close to because I think we we tend to define church sadly, particularly in the Western world, and in the states perhaps more than anywhere else because we're we're more resourced here. It's easy to define church as an experience, mm -hmm. and unless you get the experience you're looking for, you you go somewhere else, or you, you again you go nowhere else and just try and get that experience online. But it's very easy to turn church into something that we simply consume. And it's yet one more area of life where we are the customer and the customer is king. Um, and so if some minor aspect of, of a Sunday service displeases us, we go somewhere else. Um, so I think we've, we've missed that relational commitment dynamic that would have been so much more apparent to earlier generations of believers and indeed in many parts of the world today they don't have all the trappings of of church that we think of in terms of equipment and buildings and salaries and staffings and all those sorts of things and big programs but they've got each other mm -hmm. and that is the key thing being with one another and christ himself and we we are it's so easy for us to lose sight of that and to make it about all those other trappings and periphery, peripheral things. What, a, what about the home church, the, 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 small, the small church? Of, uh, I know that with, with the larger mega churches and stuff, we kind of make up for that by having small cell groups and small home gatherings, <laughs> things like that. Is the home church, can it be as powerful as a big, large church? I think it certainly can be because if, if a church is a is a true church, Jesus says, you know, with, with just two or three people, he will be present. And so you can imagine there are little, little clusters of believers in very hostile parts of the world today where I'm sure they are experiencing a sense of spiritual reality as they meet together as little clusters huddled at home, hoping no one from the, the government knocks on the door. I'm sure there's a sense of spiritual reality they enjoy that we often lack, even when we've got all the, the kind of equipment and gear and worship teams and all the rest of it. So we just need to keep our focus on what church is for. And I think the more we do that, it, it, it won't matter whether we are a massive church or a tiny church. If we can have Christ with one another, that is the thing that is key. And there are certain ways you can do that if you're a bigger church. There are certain ways you can do that if you're a smaller church. Um, Jesus isn't as fussy as we are about who he will gather with. Um, <laughs> what, a glorious, what a glorious truth that is. That's true. He doesn't mind if it doesn't look impressive. Um, you know, so as long as we have him, the, you know, if we get to have a nice building, well, that's a nice, that's an added bonus, but it mustn't become about that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's... When you look at uh, what happened during the, the whole COVID shutdown, churches weren't considered essential. Uh, uh, I think gambling casinos were considered essential. You know, some, some of those things were essential. Church wasn't. But how essential is it, not just to those that gather there, but to the greater community? How essential is the church? Yeah, well, I, I would hope and... and different leaders in different parts of the country and in, in other parts of the world, you know, different leaders saw this differently. So you're right, there were some leaders who said, well, the casinos can open, but the churches can't. And, you know, there, there will be some financial reason why that, <laughs> sure. that calculation was made. Um, there will be other leaders who actually recognise, and, and we've seen a bit of this in the UK, that there is a societal benefit that comes through churches meeting there's a there's a benefit to mental health there's a benefit to relief being given to the poor 
um, there's all these sometimes tangible, sometimes intangible benefits to the wider community, people who may have none of the beliefs that the church holds, and yet who nevertheless are blessed directly or indirectly through the presence and life of that church. So I would hope church is essential, not just for the believer, but for the unbeliever, um, because of all those other things that, that can flow from the church. Mm -hmm. Well, what we've seen uh, at the time when they were shutting churches down is a lot of people got comfortable on Sunday morning. I, w I was there on Sunday morning with my cup of coffee in, fr in front of my, my laptop with my wife, and we were watching church. And our church did yeah. a great job of it. I mean, they, they brought as much music as they can. They brought a great word. Yep. But it's so easy to get comfortable. Uh, does the church survive after all this? Well, the, you, you, you see people coming back because they're hungry to gather or they're staying away because they're comfortable in their own, in their own home. What, are we, what can yeah. we anticipate as, as all this dissipates and we get back to the church? Yeah, I think we'll see both of those trends, to be honest. There'll be some who think, you know, hey, I can do this from bed. This is great. <laughs> yeah. Why would I go back to, you know, putting on stiff clothes and driving a couple of miles? Um, but I think at the same time, there'll be a lot of people who realize, actually, I mean, what a blessing live stream has been over this past year <clears> or so. But it's not the same and it's not enough. It's It's way better than nothing. And we praise God for it. But um, I, I think of it like this. If if a really dear friend or family member was overseas for a number of years and the best you could do would, would be to Skype them every couple of days or so, and then they came back home, you wouldn't be thinking, oh, great, you're home. Let's, let's sit in, in different rooms and Skype again. <laughs> You'd be thinking, I get to see you now. I get to be in the same room. I get to hug you. And there should be something of that yearning with our church families, not just with particular individuals that we've missed more than others, but with the body itself, um, that we should be straining to get back there physically because, yes, Skype has been great, live streams have been great because it gave us something, but it didn't give us the, the fully orbed physical presence that, that we know in our heart of hearts that we need. And... That is so precious to Christ himself. So I, I really hope that as, as people are more and more able to return, it's not just a question of can I, but will I? Mm -hmm. um, not just a matter of am I able to, but am I, can I be bothered to? See, that's, um, mm -hmm. And that the real issue there is, is if if the church is the bride of Christ, if if the local congregation is his beloved, how far are we really going to get in our relationship with him if we're ignoring her? Remember, you can watch these episodes again and share them on your social media, from YouTube and from our Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of Viewpoint. Viewpoint.